In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Christ is in our midst. Was this and all it shall be. Now, to some of you who pay attention to my sermons, this story might sound familiar because it's, it's honestly a story or similar to a story that I've confessed before and shared with you in the past. Most of the details are different from that previous story, but the spiritual struggle I'm about to share with you from this most recent example is exactly the same, and it appears not fully healed in my heart. So some background. I'm from the generation that stopped carrying cash a long time ago. First, I would just carry my card around with me, and now, to be honest, everything I have and need, I pay for with my phone. I don't really carry cash, except for one thing. There's only one reason why I, why I will carry cash on me, and it is for the Sunday morning tray. That's the only reason I really carry cash, and the reality is, now with the mobile app, I don't even really need to, but I still do. So, that's the background. One Saturday afternoon earlier this summer, I happened to end the day and have a $100 bill in my wallet, and that was all. And I thought to myself, I'm going to have to break this before Sunday so that I'll have money for the tray. Now, do you see the problem with this logic? I had $100. I had money for the tray, but $100 is really too big for the trays, right? We throw in a few dollars, almost more really symbolically than sacrificially, in our giving to God. So that afternoon, after I was having these thoughts, I had to travel into the city and bless a couple at their engagement party. And I figured there'd be somewhere to stop on the way and I could break this large bill so that I could make my small offering to God. And if you're familiar with the book of Acts, this plan has disaster written all over it. In the early church, two members named Ananias and Sapphira made a similar offering to God by holding back for themselves. And they were immediately struck dead because of their deceit and their greed. Now, this is what I was planning, the company I was planning to keep as I thought about how I'm going to break this large bill so that I can give my small donation to the church. And getting into the city, I, ex I exited on the expressway, and right there at the off-ramp was a woman holding up a cardboard sign. Please help, children to feed, God bless. And the light at the intersection was red, and I was the first car coming up. Again, I thought to myself, I have a $100 bill, but $100 is really too big for a person, right? We throw a few dollars at a person, almost more symbolically than sacrificially giving to God. But isn't that what we do when we're giving to the poor, giving to God? He said, quote, and as much as you did it to the least of one of these, my brethren, you did it to me. And so what came to my mind as I saw that woman in need was that I had spent all day trying to deceive God out of how to receive my full sacrificial offering and to give whatever I had to him, even looking at the face of another person. At that moment, everything became clear. My attachment to money tempted me to deprive God twice. First, by planning to withhold my offering in the tray, and second, by debating whether or not this woman in need would receive the only bill that I had. God knew that I was planning to sin on him against him on Sunday, so in his great mercy for me, he placed the person in need in front of me on Saturday. I don't know how else to describe really what was going on and what happened and how he pulled the veil from my eyes. In the church we teach, and I myself have taught so many times about how the material wealth and the gifts that we have and everything we possess is a gift from God and therefore truly belongs to him. Yet here I am twice over thinking about withholding from God the things that already belong to him, first in his church and then second in a person in need. And when I handed over that $100 bill to the woman on the corner, I knew no matter how much food 
no matter if it bought her a night in a hotel or any other way that she might use this money for her, for her children, the biggest gift of that interaction was the deliverance of my soul from sin. I had built up too much of an attachment to the money in my wallet. At that, inter that, that intersection, we exchanged gifts and blessings. Her worldly suffering was alleviated even just a little bit. And my eternal suffering, like the rich man in the parable we hear today, was undone. We blessed each other. And quite honestly, I've thought about it many times, and I'm not even sure if that woman was even there, really a person, or if she was an angel sent by the Lord to help heal me from this attachment that I had to my wallet. Without that moment of illumination, without seeing in her God, I would have continued, just like the rich man today, to walk past the needs of others. This rich man sees Lazarus at his gate every day and walks past him without a care or a thought, either for Lazarus' own sufferings or even a care for his own soul. St. John Chrysostom tells us that the rich man had everything he needed for salvation, and yet he ends up in the fires of hell. Why? Because he could not see the sufferings of Lazarus and his humanity, nor could he see the pain that he was inflicting on his own soul by being so greedy with his own wealth. St. John Chrysostom tells us he had everything he needed for salvation. He had the riches and the wealth and he had a person in need to share. Again, St. John tells us that the poor exist for the salvation of the rich, and the rich exist to help the poor. This relationship that we keep with those in need is a two-way street. By giving to them, we not only alleviate their suffering, and bring them into our home and into our world and into the arms of Abraham and share with him love and embrace. But in doing so, we release ourselves from the fate of the rich man. God has given us everything we need for salvation. He has given us the gifts, our wealth, our talents, he has given us blessing upon blessing, and he has also put in our life, in front of our very faces, the people who most need those blessings more than us. The proper way that we steward, and the proper way that we shepherd, and the proper way that we utilize the gifts that God has given us is not to ignore the needs of those around us and hold on for ourselves like the rich man does to Lazarus, or like I had planned to do to this church and to that woman on the street, but the proper way for us to utilize the gifts that God has given us is to give them away to those who need them more alleviating their suffering and saving our souls. Amen.